Take it away, Andrew. Well, thank you, Tammy. Uh, this is Andrew Marinus. I'm talking to you from Nashville, Tennessee, where I live and work at Vanderbilt University. Uh, I wish I was there in Kansas. I had expected to spend quite a bit of time in 2020 in Kansas because of the subject of my new book, which is uh, Games of Deception. And it has several uh, Kansas elements to it. I was able to launch the book in McPherson and spend some time um, in the Kansas City area uh, when the book first came out, but i um, really excited to have this opportunity to share a little bit of this story with everybody today. Um, this is me when I was a kid. Um, and when I was uh, growing up, I lived in Washington, DC and was a uh, baseball player and loved writing and reading about sports. So uh, I guess my introduction to this world that I'm in now came when I was in middle school and wrote this magazine called AJ's Sports Journal, uh, where I wrote about my favorite teams uh, and favorite players. And it wasn't for a grade or for school or anything like that. It was just something that I did for fun. Um, three years later, we moved to Austin, Texas, and uh, went to high school there and played uh, baseball again, was sports editor of our school newspaper. And one day there was a poster on the wall of the school advertising a scholarship to Vanderbilt University for high school sports writers. So it was right up my alley. I applied for it and I was lucky enough to win it. And that's how I ended up coming here uh, to Nashville. And one of the first stories that I learned uh, at my new school was the story of Perry Wallace, who you could think of as sort of the Jackie Robinson figure of the Southeastern Conference. He was the first black basketball player in the SEC uh, in the late 1960s. He had played at Vanderbilt. And I learned about him at the same time that I happened to be taking an African-American history class that was taught by this woman here, uh, Dr. Yolette Jones. And I really wanted to write a paper about Perry for her class, but I was afraid that she would say, no, you know, that we don't write about sports or athletes in college. That's not serious enough uh, topic. But thankfully, she had the same attitude as this author here, William Zinser, who said there's no subject that you don't have permission to write about, you know, and that if you really care about it, uh, you'll probably do a good job. And so she encouraged me uh, to write this paper about Perry, which you can see here, did it when I was 19 years old. And then that experience of interviewing this pioneer who was such a wise man, um, I felt was the most interesting and important thing that I did as a college student. And so years later, I came back to that topic and I wrote a biography of Perry uh, called Strong Inside, which was my first book. Um, loved writing it. I uh, was grateful that it had a, a good reception, you know, and it, it created an opportunity for me to really become uh, an author. I had just thought initially about writing this one story. Um, thanks to a historical fiction author that many of you may know, Ruta Sapetis, who lives here in Nashville. Uh, her new book is Fountains of Silence. You may have heard of uh, Salt to the Sea or Between Shades of Grey that she's written. She encouraged me to adapt Strong Inside for young readers. And so I did that, I had the, uh, what I would call the middle school edition of Strong Inside uh, came out a few years ago. Uh, I have a new book that will be coming out in March. So just a couple months from now called Singled Out, which is a biography of Glenn Burke, uh, who was the first openly gay major league baseball player. So I've discovered my niche is, you know, writing uh, nonfiction, sports, history, social justice related books uh, for middle school and, and high school students. Uh, but really want to talk to you today about Games of Deception, which, as I mentioned, has so many uh, Kansas elements to it. And this book came out uh, this past November. The paperback will be coming out on March 2nd. The idea for the book came while I was in Lawrence. I uh, was speaking at the Dole Institute uh, for Politics. And while I was there, I really wanted to see Alan Fieldhouse. Uh, where the Jayhawks play. I'd never been there before. And they showed me, and some of you may have seen this in the DeBruce Center, where they have James Naismith's original rules of basketball under glass. And the person who was showing me around said, did you know that Naismith, uh, the inventor of the game, was able to see his invention played at the Olympics? And I didn't know that. And I asked him, well, which Olympics was that? And when he said it was the 1936 Olympics in Nazi Germany, uh, I figured I had the subject for my next book. And I got started the very next day. Uh, the three major themes in the book are who was Naismith, this man who uh, invented basketball, why did he invent it? And of course, he has a connection to Kansas. He became the co first basketball coach at KU and the athletic director there. Uh, who were the players 
on this team, who was the first dream team, and half of the team came from McPherson, Kansas. And then third, and probably most important, what was the state of the world at that time? And what can we learn from uh, the experience of these American Olympians in Nazi Germany at the Olympics? Uh, so Naismith invented basketball. Uh, you may know the story at the YMCA training school in Springfield, Massachusetts. He was uh, basically challenged by his professor to come up with a game to keep the students busy in the winter. They played baseball in the spring and football in the fall, but they really had not much to do in their gymnasium in the winter. And so he stayed up uh, one night, the night before his project was due, like just about any other student, you know, and, and invented a game. And we actually have a sketch of the first game of basketball, which I think is amazing. We don't know when the first baseball game was played or who was the first person to go golfing, but we actually have a, a sketch of literally the first basketball game ever made, uh, played. So after the game was invented and it starts to spread around the world, thanks to the YMCA where he invented it, they were sharing the rules with Ys all over the world. Uh, Naismith comes to Lawrence. He's, as I mentioned, the athletic director uh, at Kansas. Uh, Fog Allen, who you see here in the picture with him with a, a Jayhawk basketball player. Naismith's called the father of basketball. Fog Allen's called the father of basketball coaching. He was the one who really envisioned the tournament game, you know, that we think of now, he invented uh, NCAA tournament. He was the one that really pushed for basketball to be included in the Olympics. He thought he would get it in the 1932 Olympics in Los Angeles and struck out, but was able to um, lobby actual Nazis uh, to get basketball included in the 36 Olympics. And so then the question was, after we uh, found out that basketball would be included for the first time, who would the players be? And they didn't have uh, a tryout tournament um, as you would have today. Uh, they decided to have um, a tournament where entire teams would play and whichever two teams advanced to the championship would be combined to become the U.S. Olympic team. Um, one of those two teams was from McPherson. Uh, these guys all worked at the Globe Oil Refinery in McPherson, Kansas. They were called the tallest team in the world. Uh, they played a more modern uh, style of basketball, full court press, uh, fast break offense. The guy you see here, um, Second to the right, his name is Joe Fortenberry. He's considered the first player ever to dunk the basketball in a game. Uh, he did it at Madison Square Garden. And the New York Times reporter had to describe this unusual shot to his teammates, or I mean, to his readers. And he said, it looked like someone dunking their donut in coffee. And that's where the term dunk comes from, from Joe McPherson, from the McPherson refiners. Andrew? Yes, you have two minutes left. This All is right, fascinating. Thanks. Can you tell us how to get a hold of you if we want to, you to come to our library? Yes, you can get a hold of me. Uh, my email address is andrewmarinus at gmail.com. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at trublu24 and message me there. Go to my website, andrewmarinus.com, and there's a contact page there as well. And I would love to speak at libraries or two libraries. Um, this is kind of a condensed version of my presentation. You can see here the other half of the team came from Universal Pictures in Hollywood. So they were merged with these guys from Kansas. I talk a lot about in the book about what uh, the state of uh, Nazi Germany was at that time. Here you see the swastika next to the Olympic rings. This is where the world comes uh, to play in the Olympics. Uh, young people especially love seeing these pictures here. They played the games outside. Uh, not in a gymnasium, there was a driving rainstorm during the gold medal game, the ball uh, became waterlogged, the court is muddy, it was sort of a farce of a game. And what I consider the most important messages of the book really have very little to do with basketball and more about uh, humanity and um, the danger of being a bystander in the face of injustice. And this idea of Elie Wiesel, he said he would swore never to be silent whenever and wherever human beings endure suffering and humiliation. You know, we must take sides. And I think that those messages are as relevant today as they were back then. So uh, thank you everybody uh, for your time. It was a pleasure to give you this real Cliff Notes <laughs> versions of Games of Deception. I'm happy uh, to talk about my other books as well, um, if you're interested in that and uh, just get in touch and I'd, I'd love to set something up with you. Thank you.